Vă salut, dragi prieteni ai basketului. În seria noastră de interviuri, îl avem astăzi ca și invitat pe fostul antrenor al lui Umo Bitelco, antrenorul care a schimbat mentalitatea multor jucători și antrenori și care a venit cu o altă viziune asupra jocului de basket. Totodată, înspre sfârșitul interviului, vom avea și un invitat surpriză. Deci, Ted Baldwin, my mentor. Welcome, Ted, and uh, thank you for accepting this interview. Mulțumesc! It's great to see you, Marcel. Great to be back uh, in Romania in uh, one manner of speaking, although I'm here in Manila, but uh, joining the Romanian people through uh, your podcast. So it's, it's great to be here. Yeah. Uh, please share with us what is your actual status? What are you doing these days? Um, not much these days. The coronavirus is <laughs> dominating everybody's life. Um, but uh, once we're all freed from this uh, quarantine, then it will be back to work. So for me, uh, here in the Philippines, basketball is, uh, is like a religion. Um, it's, uh, it's played year round. Um, the coaches work extremely hard and, and uh, having had a little bit of success here lately, uh, They've managed to give me three jobs. So uh, my main job right now is uh, coaching the University of Ateneo. Uh, and our system here in the Philippines is much like the U.S. So the university basketball is uh, very, very strong, very big. Uh, last year in the finals, we played the final game in front of 23,000 people. So uh, oh it's, it's very, very popular Uh, you you, you send me event. you send me some uh, footage from from that game. It was impressive. Yeah, it, it it really is. We play in beautiful stadiums. There's no difference our, our stadiums here than the NBA stadiums, and and the size is similar as well. So uh, for the big games, we get we get very very big crowds. Um, but I also uh, am a consultant to one of the professional teams. Um, so that keeps me involved in the professional league here. And my third job is a relatively new job. Uh, so in 2015 and 16, uh, I was the national coach here in the Philippines. And, um, and then I was replaced in 2016. But now that they've brought me back in, uh, but it's a, it's a different position. I'm, I'm, pro I'm called the program coordinator for the 2023 World Championship. So my job really is to control the program in terms of the development of the players that we project to be in the national team in 2023. So we're trying to contract them separate from uh, the professional league, uh, control them um, and train them and build them into a team that is uh, almost independent of any other basketball entities here. So it's, it's kind of like professionalizing the national team. And we're doing that step by step. So each year when, uh, when the collegiate season finishes and players come out of the colleges and become eligible for the professional league, we take our pick of those players that we think project as national team players and we bring them in at the age of 22, 23. So we've been running this for only about six months so far. And we've got seven players uh, that we're projecting for 2023. And we'll continue to build that uh, program over the next three and a half years. So uh, tell us about uh, your team where you are uh, the head coach, because you said a little bit of success. For me, winning the three times in a row, the championship is not a little bit of success. So tell me more about it. First of all, the profile of the team and the size of the championship can be uh, something similar for the people to understand, uh, for something similar with NCAA in the U.S. It is, except the number of universities is very small. So we, we only play in Manila against the Manila University. So there's eight, and they're very, very big universities. Of course, Manila is a population of around 20 million people. So we have eight universities, and, and they vary in size. We're one of the smaller private ones. We're about 10,000 people. Up to uh, a couple of universities have upwards of 60,000 students. 
So, you know, it, it's, it's a very interesting league. Uh, it's next season will be its 83rd year of competition. So it has a tremendous history. Uh, there are many, many great stories, great players, great teams that have come through in the years. So it's a real privilege to, to be involved in something that, that has this history and that, you know, it has the power in the basketball landscape here. So my university is Ateneo University, and, and I've been with them four years. We'll be entering our fifth year this year, this coming year. And uh, in my first year, was uh, we were in a transition, and we started the year pretty tough. We, we lost some games, but we, we got ourselves going. We made it to the finals that year and lost to a great team in the finals. And then, uh, you know, we made some changes. We... You know, I adapted to coaching young players again because I hadn't done that in, you know, I don't know, 20 years probably. And so I don't changed my philosophy. Up. Yeah, <laughs> I, I changed my philosophy to uh, development. And we, we started, we, we stopped talking about winning. We stopped talking about championships. We started talking about um, developing these young kids to become professional players and building them as basketball players. And so the byproduct of that was to build a culture around them uh, that would win games. And I think when you have, you know, longevity in your contract and security in your contract, you don't have to worry so much. But I, I was very fortunate in our second year, we, we had a great season. Uh, we only lost one game uh, in the regular season. And then uh, we... We tripped up in the playoffs a little bit, but it's a best of three. So we managed to make it all the way to the finals and, and we won the finals in the best of three. And then the next year we were pretty dominant. Uh, we we uh, got about halfway through the season with two losses and then we didn't lose again. And then this past season, uh, we didn't lose at all the whole season. So the team's on a pretty good winning streak now. I think it's... 26 games in a row, something like that, and uh, three championships. So this is the little success, what you were talking. Well, when you compare it to, you know, what's in front of us, you know, we hope that we continue this uh, legacy of success and maybe we, met, we win five or six more. So what's behind us becomes little. <laughs> then. For sure. I mean, you are used to it, this, because you won like seven or six in New Zealand with the, in the Pro League. I won five there, five oh, in six five. years. <laughs> yeah, you know, you, time after time goes by, you like to exaggerate a little bit. But uh, I like to keep the real news the news. So, uh, yeah, it's... Um, oh, okay. It, you know. uh, I, I want to ask you, because you, you pointed out something very interesting. Uh, in this age, yes, you said uh, they are uh, about... Uh, uh, 22, 23 years old, the, the most, the, the oldest players, yes? That's correct, yes. And you don't speak about winning, you speak about player development. Uh, we, we never, ever, and, and here's something interesting for you and the listeners there, because basketball is, you know, it really is, you, you can't imagine until you come to the Philippines how big it is. So what I'm going to tell you is, is really going to blow your mind. Marcel, I have nine assistant coaches. Nine. Oh, oh, my God. So when we walk on the court for practice, you know, there's 10 coaches out there, and we generally <laughs> have about 20 to 25 players out there at the same time. So um, our roster is 16 players, but, but we have a, a second team, and many of those players were grooming to be in the first team. So it's just wall-to-wall -wall yeah. basketball. And so um, literally when we go on the court, we start training in January for a season which starts in September. So wow. we train and we finish in December. So we train really the whole year. And so from January until June, we don't do any team, you know, systems at all. We, we keep it very much based on individual development. We develop the mind, we develop the body, and we develop the skill. And when I say the mind, we teach basketball concepts like the pick and roll. How do you defend it? All the different ways. How do you run it? 
What do you look at? What do you see? So all the different, you know, systems of screening and, and uh, transition, we, we teach those in the classroom, actually. And um, so we really dedicate ourselves to the players. And so when they walk on the court, they can speak any vocabulary of any coach that they go to play for in the future. And that's really our goal. And like when we, we have a system much like the U.S., as I said, so when they graduate from college here, they go into a draft for the PBA, the professional league. So it's just like the NBA. And uh, this past year, uh, I had five graduating players. Four of them became eligible for the draft. And um, one is going to go play overseas in Japan. So he didn't enter the draft. Those four players were chosen one, two, three, and five in the draft. So, you know, what we, what we really want to do in our program, we are doing. And, um, and that's what I'm really proud of. It's very, very nice to hear uh, that people who support this program uh, understand exactly what is the job of the coach and what uh, they should expect from a young player. It's great to to have this understanding uh, for your job and for your assistants, and I'm sure that your assistants will uh, uh, have to learn, and they learned a lot from you, uh, because you was uh, a mentor for a lot of uh, coaches in your career, and I uh, myself, I am uh, one of uh, those that I can say proudly that I was uh, uh, your assistant, Maybe assistant is too much at that time because I was learning in that time everything. I was absorbing everything from you. I practically sit one and a half year next to you, learning day by day and uh, uh, wanting to, to progress. And I want to publicly uh, to, to thank you for that. Well, Marcel, I thank you for that. That's, that's very kind of you to say that. And, and I'm very proud that a lot of my ex-players and some of my ex-assistant coaches have gone on to very good coaching success. But I do have to say, Marcel, that you are an excellent coach in your own right. And you proved that very quickly, you know, after uh, becoming a head coach in Romania and the success that you then went on and had. And, you know, your enthusiasm, your passion for the game and, and your intellect. And I'm sure you brought that, you know, from your playing days combined with uh, what I suspect and what I have heard from other people was a, a very tough, aggressive mentality. You know, all of those things are what combine, you know, I'm sure to, to have made you an excellent coach. And, you know, the part that I played was a privilege uh, to, to be able to play that for all of the ex players and ex assistant coaches that I've had. It's always a privilege to touch people's lives and to help them give back something to the game as a coach that we all took from the game and, and enjoyed as players. For sure. I, I took a lot of things from, uh, from your way of uh, teaching. And uh, I want to, to ask you a question. What do you think that you are more? You are uh, a teacher or a coach? or a teacher coach <laughs> because you know it's a difference it is a difference and and i think honestly you have to play both roles and of course you're probably going to be stronger in one of those roles than the other you know you you take a guy like zelko obradovich at fenerbahce you know he's the ultimate coach uh, but he's also an excellent teacher but he puts teaching uh, as secondary because his success, which has been phenomenal, is built on his ability once he – he's great on the practice floor, but once he gets on the sideline in a game, then you see his genius, you know, and, and he's a tremendous coach. But, but I've – you know, I know co I, one of his assistant coaches is a former assistant coach of mine, and so he tells me that he's very good in the practices too. But you take a guy like Penny Gershon several years ago from Israel, you know, Penny didn't do anything in practices, but was, again, a genius on the sidelines. So if you ask me, you know, what I am, I tend to believe that, that the basis of the success that I've had in my career is that I believe so much in preparation. Uh, 
I'm a meticulous planner and preparer. And so I think that that's reflected more on the practice court than perhaps in the games. But I also think that when you you go into the environment of a game, which is quick decisions and, and you know quick reads about what's happening, the more prepared you are, the, the more relaxed you're going to be and able to make you know good decisions and clear decisions. But you know, I think of the two, I'm probably more suited to teaching the game and, uh, and the, the joy that I get from the practice floor. I've never been a guy that says that, the, that games are fun. Uh, they're fun for the players. But for the coaches, we always know we have a knife at our throat. And so, you know, how much fun is it to live your life with a knife at your throat? You know, <laughs> if you lose, everybody's going to blame you. And you, I'm telling you, most coaches don't have anything to do with wins and losses, you know, other than what they do on the practice floor. But the perception is, you know, that we are orchestrating the outcome of the game. And if we lose, it's our fault. So I, I don't enjoy the game so much, but I love the practice floor. Of course, we we all had the benefits of your uh, teachings in a, in a court in the practice uh, floor, and uh, I remember the how much time I spent with preparation. How you said scouting, uh, you uh, made me understand how important it is to scout, but real and good and professional scouting, the opponents, own team, individual player. So like this, you can have a quicker vision about what you have to do or what solution you can approach in the practices and or preparing the game. So I took a lot of things, especially methodic of teaching, which uh, it was great. And I recommend to all the coaches who want to learn to, to stay near an experienced and good coach because it's the best way to, to learn and to advance in this job. It definitely is. Uh, you know, there, there are a lot of people around the world that, that are buying into the certification process of coaches and referees and, and things like, you know, like that, that you can actually study a book and become a coach. Well, you can't. I mean, really, the best way to learn is what you said, is to apprentice yourself to a very good coach and to sit and observe and observe not just what, but how. It's very important in coaching that you you relay knowledge and information to your players, um, to your assistant coaches, that you do that in a manner that that they can do something with the information. You know, and I think that that certifying coaches is, and I know that FIBA believes in this so much, but I think that it is probably the most false and fake thing going on, not just in basketball but in a lot of the academic world, it's really when you get out and get your hands dirty. Uh, you, you, you can't tell me that you can learn how to be a mechanic in a school. You got to get your hands in the grease, you know, and, and in, the, in the fuel and the oil, and uh, then you can learn. For sure. Uh, two things <laughs> I'm going to ask you now, because you, you are a big fan of those. So, you still running the triangle offense? This is question number one. And question, question number two, do you uh, have the same system in defending the on-ball screens? Um, the answer to both questions is no, interestingly <laughs> enough. Um, I ran the triangle offense from 1995 to 2013. And uh, when I came to the Philippines, um, they were running at the national team because I came here as a consultant to the national team. So I didn't have a head coaching job. So the head coach was running the dribble drive offense, uh, which was in vogue and in fashion. And I really liked it. And um, so uh, the next time I had the opportunity to be a head coach was the national team two years later. And so I stayed with the dribble drive. I had spent two years learning it. And um, I thought it really suited the Philippine player because, um, you know, that we're, we're very small here and very quick and very skilled and shifty players. So the isolation game was very attractive. But I think very quickly 
um, particularly when some teams started running it in Europe, the European coaches are just too clever. And they started using defensive angles. They started using different help schemes. And those teams that were running dribble drive all of a sudden found out there just wasn't that much room on the court to be able to exploit gaps. For sure. And, um, and so the dribble drive, I think, is dying a slow death. And you don't see it too much anymore. Uh, of course, you see isolations now. And you see spacing of the court based on those isolations. And some of that is similar to dribble drive, but it's not the dribble drive offense. So I ran that for a couple of years. And, um, and then uh, I started, uh, because I was coaching the collegiate team, I started thinking to myself, these kids need to know how to run many different kinds of offenses because who knows who they're going to play for as pros. So I started teaching a variety of offenses uh, with them and uh, designing some offenses. I used Pete Carrill's, you know, some of the high post offense. Um, I, I used uh, the flow offense that, that became very popular down in Australia, which is the, the backdoor handoff, you know, consecutive action from side to side. Of course, I'm still using and teaching the ball screen offenses, the set play offenses out of Europe. So we've been doing a lot of that, but it's your question is so timely because during this quarantine, I've been watching a lot of old basketball films, particularly my New Zealand team, and I've fallen in love with the triangle again. So <laughs> I think that when we start up, I think I'm going to go back to teaching it. But one of the problems with the triangle is – it's it's a jump shooter's offense. It's not a great three-point offense. And of course the game has evolved now, you know, to to attack the rim or shoot the three. But I'm anticipating that the line is going to move back again. I think the the powers that be have got to bring the low post back into the game. They've got to bring the mid-range game back into the game. And you do that, of course, by making the three-point shot more difficult. So if they do that, for sure the triangle is back in. <laughs> I mean, you know, triangle offense means uh, smart play collectively. You know, uh, this is a very elegant style of playing for smart players, smart coaches. And uh, we saw what uh, Chicago in the good days could do with this offense, with the right players in the right position. So... Uh, and we saw your team also playing great basketball at the uh, World Championship, um, which was a huge surprise for everybody. Nobody in this world could believe that you would play the semifinal of the World Championship against the big Yugoslavia and you will dominate them for 25 minutes. I saw that's, today the game. I was impressed, really. That's that's pretty much true. And and actually, I watched it today too. Again, okay. it's probably the third time I've watched it. And you know what? Whenever I watch it, it still hurts that we lost because the third you, quarter hurts. Huh? As you said, we we um, we had our own way for 25 minutes. Actually, about 27 minutes of that game, we. Uh, we were far superior to them, but uh, they wore us down. You know, they did the smart things. They beat us up. Uh, they used their physicality, their experience. And, um, you know, they deserved to win. But we had such a close taste of, you know, getting to the finals of the world champs that it, it still hurts to this day. It still hurts. And I'll, I'll tell you, you know, a little quick little story if we've got time. We have. But, don't worry. The triangle was introduced to me in 1995 when I was in Australia coaching in a junior tournament. And I remember saying to the American coach who said, have you ever seen the triangle? I remember saying, come on, you know, why, why do you, I don't have Michael Jordan. Why do you ask me if I know the triangle? And he said, no, 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 you, you need to see this offense for the beauty of the offense. And I said, you're telling me that this is a great offense without Michael Jordan. And he said, absolutely. And so, yeah, you know, uh, I guess 18 years of running it, uh, I was convinced that uh, it truly is a beautiful offense and uh, a wonderful offense. 
You asked me about my ball screen defense. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. You, you, you was an innovator with that. I mean, a lot of teams was very uh, tricked by this type of defense. Well, you know, there's a story behind that too. Um, oh, of course. So, so what you're referring to is is when teams would run a ball screen against us, we would switch to a zone. Exactly. And, um, and we would play the rest of the possession as a zone defense. So we would kill the ball screen and, uh, and then we would have an established defense because in essence, a ball screen is designed to remove one defender from the defense for, you know, a quarter to a half a second and see if you can find the solution. The you can remove. create an advantage. Correct. So after you remove that defender by screening him or by forcing him to trail, then you create an opportunity. It has to be very quick, but, you know, players are great at this. And so, you know, I, I really didn't even understand ball screen defense as I was coaching the New Zealand national team because New Zealand, the landscape there was not very sophisticated. So we prepared our national team in 2002, and then we went to France to play France on, on our road to Indianapolis for the world champs. And France just destroyed us with balls. With, with on ball screen. With on ball screens. And so, Coach Nenad Vucinic, my extremely brilliant assistant coach at that time, he and I went back to the hotel that night. We were depressed. We were like, oh, you know, we, we can't defend, <laughs> you know, and that's all we're going to see now. You know, we can't defend ball screens. So, we sat down and, you know, we started talking, and I said, well, you know, we can't switch every ball screen, but that's the way to, you know, keep your defense in front of the ball is to switch. And, you know, just in talking, I said, well, what if we, you know, because as soon as you switch and put a big man on the ball, he's obviously exposed. And not only that, the big screener is going to roll down with your guard on him. And now he's got a mismatch inside. So I said, we can solve that by triple switching, but we can't solve the problem of the guard isolating the big man. And it just occurred to me that no guard in the world wants to isolate against his own defense. You know, you want to move the ball. And, you know, that was the inception of, of the idea of, okay, switch the big onto the ball, but then put a zone behind him. And now when the guard sees a zone, if he passes, now we can switch the zone around to get our big man in the back near the basket where he belongs and get guards up front. And so it, 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 was, uh, it was a lot of fun. We did that for a lot of years, didn't we? And uh, we, had, we confused some coaches with that. Of course, of course, a lot of. I can tell that because I was a witness on that. Uh, tell me a little bit, because, you know, it's very interesting. I mean, you played against uh, Bodiroga, Stojakovic, Divac, Gurovic, uh, Dirk, Novitski. I mean, come on. It was the, the la creme de la creme uh, in the world. It was everybody there. It, it really was, was the United a... States who lost. Unbelievable. Yes. yes. It really was a golden generation of, of international basketball. Because you, you mentioned a few, you mentioned the great Yugoslavian players and, and of course, Dirk Nowitzki, but, you know, you left out the young kids of Spain. So Paul Gasol and Rudy Fernandez and Navarro and Calderon Navarro. and, cool. you know, and of course, from down in South America, here comes the Argentinians with Oberto and Scola and Nocioni and Ginobili and uh, Delfino. And, and so, uh, and we didn't know any of these guys down in New Zealand. It, you know, we only knew, you know, Alan Iverson and Stefan Marbury and, you know, these guys. And, this is uh, funny. And so, you know, we got introduced pretty quickly <laughs> to, to the uh, quality of these great, great players. You know, going back to the zone defense, this is this will be interesting for your listeners. Uh, we were playing, uh, I was coaching Pauk in Greece. And uh, we were switching ball screens to a zone defense. And the first game of the season, we're going to play Panathinaikos. And um, coached yes, by Yesikovicius, that's right. Coached oh, okay. by Obradovich. Okay. So, 
So um, they hadn't really, I mean, we'd played some preseason games, so they might have known what we were doing, but they didn't look like it. So we come down on the first play, and of course, Yaskovicius is one of the greatest ball screen guards ever of all time. I'd rate him up there with John Stockton, and probably better, to be honest. So he comes down and, and uh, ball screen, and we switch our big man onto him, and he has a look, and we pass the, he passes the ball to the corner. And, of course, our big man turns and sprints away, and our guards rotate, and so now we have our zone set. And uh, they didn't score. And so uh, the next possession, he comes down and he calls exactly the same play. <laughs> and, uh, and so he runs the same play he run, does the exact same thing we switch switch to his own Yaskovicius passes the ball to a corner and as soon as he let it go our big man sprints away and Yaskovicius asks for it back, back. catch three and I went uh oh <laughs> <laughs> we have a problem <laughs> and I talked to him after the game and he said, uh, he said, I had no idea what was going on. He said, it looked like a switch, and then this guy just runs away from me when I give the ball up. And he said, so I said to myself, I said, well, if they're going to leave me open, I'm going to shoot the ball. So uh, that's, a, that's a little insight into how intelligent that great, great player is. And now isn't he doing wonders as a coach? Uh, yes. a tremendous coach now. Zalgiris, it's making wonders how you say yes. with one of the smallest budget in the league. Yes. yes. Um, you didn't had any, you know, superstar in your team, but you played kind of very modern type of game with a small setup. You didn't have a very big uh, dominant five. Uh, but you had uh, bigs who can shoot, who can pass the ball, unbelievable. I remember Pedro Cameroon. Who That's was, correct. Who didn't look like, you know, that he can do so many things and he can be so useful. And uh, also you can have, uh, uh, I remember Kirk Penny, the shooter. Hell of a shooter. So these two players I can remember, but the rest of the team I really cannot remember. You know, like uh, like like players who would dominate uh, an important league somewhere. But you well, still made a, uh, managed to do a, a great job. We we had very very fine basketball players. I mean, you mentioned Piero Cameron. Piero Cameron. Uh, I've coached almost forty years now, and uh, never never at the super high level but um Piero Cameron's the smartest basketball player not only that I've ever coached he's the smartest basketball player I've ever seen and that includes what I've seen on TV and that includes Larry Bird um Piero had an innate knowledge of the game of basketball uh prior to what was going to happen he he understood but not just understood he had a way of manipulating what was going to happen. And, um, you know, being a man of six foot six and about 310 pounds, he was a physical anomaly as well. You know, he, he, he didn't look like a basketball player. Um, <laughs> he didn't look like, but when you see him play, playing, you was impressed by what he can do. But everybody that played against him walked away knowing that they had played against a great, great basketball player. And, um, now he's a real fine coach. He's now the coach of the New Zealand national team. So, oh. you know, very, very, very proud of him. But, you know, on that team, besides Kirk Penny, um, Phil Jones was a tremendous left-hand shooter. He played several years in Italy in the professional league. Mark Dickel was our point guard. Mark Dickel was, uh, he led the NCAA in America in assists his senior year at UNLV. And he went on and played many leagues, played for Alba Berlin in the Euro League. So we had very accomplished players, but you're right. They weren't players that anybody ever looked at to come in and, and anchor the greatness of a team. They were role players. And I exactly. think if I think if, you know, I was talking with Coach Mark Dickel. Mark is now coaching here in the Philippines. He's the oh. national coach of the Philippines now. 
Oh, so he's, a, he's another one of my ex players that's uh, gone on and, and done very well. So we were talking the other day and I said to him, I said, Mark, why was our 2002, 2014, why were they as good as they were? And he didn't have the answer. You know, he said unselfishness. And I said, no, it's more than that. I said, if you watch us play, not one single player on our team ever tries to make a play to create something out of control. We just didn't do it. They understood the merits of using screens, spacing, timing, angles, the talents of one another. They understood that. And I don't necessarily think it was me that, that you know, rooted that in them. I think selecting those guys was a big factor in getting that chemistry. But watching that team play, you see a team that is consistently outmanned in terms of talent, but you also see a team that never, ever makes foolish plays or foolish mistakes. And consequently, they hang around you know, against great teams. And uh, they were very, very tough to beat. Uh, we didn't win all of our games, but they were very difficult to beat. I saw one thing, uh, which, um, you know, I see from outside, you know, I don't have all these insights. What I saw, I saw great chemistry in between the players. And I saw also, I had the feeling that they have no fear. They uh, didn't, both they didn't care about uh, uh, against who they were playing. Both of those qualities. Well, one of them was unique to that team. I shouldn't say unique because I'm sure other teams have developed that, you know, over the course of years. Uh, but one is unique to New Zealanders. They, they don't fear. They understand they're always the underdog. Most of those guys played rugby as young men, as young kids. So there's a toughness to them, a physical toughness, a, a lack of fear of anybody, a confrontation, confrontational nature to them. I remember when we beat Serbia in the Olympics, Coach Obradovic at the post-game press conference called us the dirtiest team in the world. And I remember when I had my chance to talk and somebody asked me about that comment, I said, well, I guess any excuse will do, but you can't walk out on the court against New Zealanders and expect them to play polite. They're just not going to. But the chemistry of this team uh, you know, uh, I'm actually working on a book now, Marcel. I'm, I'm putting my first book together about my 40-year career. And oh, great. There, Congratulations, there is, and I wait the copy. <laughs> you will get one for sure. But there is so much about that team that obviously is begging to be told because they were such a unique basketball team. But there's so much about their chemistry that, unfortunately, I just can't tell. Because the many, many trips on the road from country to country to country, the many nights out, the many occasions where we went out and acted like young guys, you know, and uh, that was before cell phones and cameras. And, and you know, <laughs> those stories need to stay in a vault somewhere. But let me tell you, it's those stories and literally the fist fights and uh, the covering for one another and even covering against me, the coach, you know, all of that bonded that team in such a way that um, you could beat them on the scoreboard, but you could never, ever break them ever. And uh, what a great blessing for me to be able to coach that group of men. Great uh, to hear. So two two ideas. One, uh, before bas basketball, <clears throat> bring your kid to rugby. This is <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> and uh, second, uh, build uh, real characters, and then you have a chance to build a real team. I think. I, let me just change what you just said because I like what I think you can turn that into a great saying. Marcel is is build characters to build character. And these great. guys were great characters. And that team had amazing character. Amazing. It was such a, 
confidence builder for me as a coach to walk out on the court with them and to know the fiber of that team was so strong. Um, it gave me confidence to uh, experiment with them and, and to relate to them and talk to them as mature men. You know, it wasn't a situation of coach player. We were just we were just a bunch of basketball guys that consulted one another on how to construct good play. And um, very difficult to reproduce. Um, you have to, I mean, I know that there are a lot of stories. Some of them you cannot tell, but did they had a haka for you? Did they made a haka for you? Um, Well, the haka was, you know, obviously part of our culture. They practiced it. They um, uh, they performed it for, you know, most teams and most games. And, it, and it's, you know, it's an interesting thing, the haka. It's not something they do before every game. The players sit down and, and they discuss, do we want to do a haka in this game? And um, it's totally player controlled. And, of course, you know, being an American by birth, I was – kind of outside the culture a little bit on the haka. Uh, but having lived there and become a New Zealand citizen for so long, um, one of the, and, and I will get emotional now telling you this. It happens to me every time, I know. Uh, one of the most moving moments of my entire career was um, the final game in 2006 at the World Championships when I was coaching New Zealand, I decided uh, uh, during that game that it would be my last game. And um, I went in the locker room and I told the players, you know, they were the first people that I told. And, you know, again, my great friend, Nenad Vucinich, my assistant coach, I remember the look on his face, you know, absolute shock. And uh, the team was, you know, we were crestfallen because we hadn't had a great tournament. We'd made it to the second round, but we'd, we got beat by Spain and eliminated. And, um, you know, I, I, I told them that, uh, that I was done, you know, the, and th that that was my last game. And Paul Hanari and uh, Pota Winitana, two Maori boys, uh, you know, they, um, after a pause and, You know, was, the, the, the emotion was very heavy in the room. Uh, they stood up and uh, they did a haka to me. And, you know, that, that is powerful. That is um, something that, you know, not so many people experience. And um, it was, it's a memory that, that, you know, is very strong in my mind. And uh, I can take myself back to the emotion of that room very, very easily and because of that haka. So uh, that's a, an experience that I treasure in my life it's and very, in my career. It's very interesting, you know, what basketball can bring in our lives. And uh, uh, an event like this uh, can have, I mean, a big confirmation that what you're doing what you are working every day, very hard, uh, emotions, stress, uh, tiredness, uh, a lot of uh, things that are going on around you inside of the team are paying off. Those 30 seconds, for those 30 seconds of greatness, we are dying years. That's so true. That's so true. And, but, but you know what? We love it. I mean, I don't have to tell you and probably many, many of the people that are watching have played or even coached the game. I don't have to tell probably most of them, but every single one of us that makes a living out of this game, no matter how tough it has been or, or it is for us at times, we consider ourselves blessed. We consider ourselves well in front of, 99% of the world's population, whether they be richer or poorer or more famous or uh, more secure in their professions and their jobs, um, the, the, the ability and the longevity that, 
that I have had in my coaching career and that I've developed in my coaching career, um, it's just not on the trading block, you know, for anything, for anything. It's, I'm sure of it. It's been so special. Um, yeah, it, it, you, you, know, you, speak, you, you, you are you are talking like you would like to retire next year or something like that. <laughs> Why do you speak like that? No, 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 no. I, it was your question. It's your fault. I'm speaking like this. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. You have <laughs> no, a no, lot I, to show to the world. I'm. Uh, I just turned 62 last week or two weeks ago. Bless and, you. Um, I'm feeling great. I'm feeling uh, extremely uh, fit. Uh, this coronavirus quarantine has been great for me. I've been swimming a lot and uh, working out a lot. So. Uh, I'm ready to go as soon as they'll let me out of here. Um, I'm ready to get back on the court with my players. And I, I don't see any reason to – I'm a better coach today than I have ever been in my life. So there's no reason to stop coaching. Um, I love it. I love my players. Um, I understand the game better. Uh, and I have a tremendous passion for the game. And now I think, you know, having put winning aside – and understanding that's a byproduct of the process, I'm so much better at the process now. And that's made me so much closer to the players because they understand I'm there for them. I'm not there for me. I don't have a one loss record. I don't, you know, I don't celebrate the wins. I, I celebrate the practices and I celebrate when my players get drafted and I celebrate their joy in the game and there's so much more of that than there is winning so i love it i love it now more than i've ever loved it yeah but you see it's very interesting i mean uh, you focus on the process which automatically bring the success i mean automatically i don't know if it does it automatically because you, I mean, you have to you, be good at the process for you for you it, it does <laughs> for for others maybe not but for you, it's working in, the, in this way. Well, you and I know that at the professional level, especially in Europe, most of the coaches there, they don't have a horizon where they can say, I'm going to, you know, Mr. Boss, I'm going to provide you a championship in three years. Let me build my team to that point in time. You don't get that luxury in most places in Europe. So, and I think that's wrong. I, I think that the management and owners, they need to sit back and they need to think, they need to get their egos out of the way and understand that they don't win a damn thing. There's not an owner in the world that's ever won anything. In fact, there's not a coach in the world that's ever won anything. The players win and the players lose. Those of the rest of us, we want to grab a piece of that because we think we contributed in so, to some way in that. But, but in all honesty, all we are there to do is serve the players. It's their time. And if I think if more owners thought that way, we would be producing much better coaches, much better basketball players, and most importantly, we would be producing much better basketball. But, but we're so intent on the ego trip of the joy of a victorious locker room that we're not prepared to go through the hard locker rooms, the tough losses, and the lessons you get from that in order to get those victories. And if we were, we would do much better for the sport and for ourselves. I totally agree. But you see the world in which uh, we are living, it's uh, living in a different speed, and they are all looking for shining and bright in uh, things. They want to grab them as fast as possible. And so the, their whole entire fi philosophy, it's going in this direction. Let's go a little bit back in, uh, in your career because I want to channelize you in a certain direction in this discussion. Uh, tell me how you felt the, the difference in uh, basketball philosophy you know, whatever you was coaching until the point that he was getting into Europe, because Europe kind of play his own, uh, its own style of uh, basketball. All around the world, outside of Europe, 
and and you could probably throw Argentina and to a little bit lesser degree Brazil in there. But everywhere else, the NBA and the American basketball scene dominates the mentality of how the game should be played. The NBA has learned over the last 10 years that they have to play the game the way the European coaches teach it. So now you're starting to get the mutation which is going to produce, I think, the greatest basketball that any of us have ever seen. But in New Zealand, back in the day before I came to Europe to coach and before I coached the national team, I was really only influenced by uh, by the NBA, but also by what I had learned and studied, uh, mostly from Dean Smith, the great coach of North Carolina, in terms of defenses, a lot from John Wooden in terms of offenses, and and then of course later Tex Winter and the triangle offense. But you know, for me, uh, I was always trying to understand a system. I, I remember when I adopted Jerry Tarkanian's amoeba defense, and and I you know I studied that, studied it, studied it, and wanted to understand the drills. So I was always looking for a system, which I think is wrong in, in retrospect, uh, because you need to teach the elements of the game, and then you can run any system. And I think that's what they do a great job of in Europe. Like European coaches could run triangle if they wanted to in a snap because they know how to teach all the elements of the triangle. And they could run the flex. They could run the flow. They could run John Wooden's high post offense. They could run the shuffle. It doesn't matter because they know how to teach the elements and they do teach the elements. But they're, you know, they're interested in the, you know, the quick good shot that they can get uh, usually using ball screens. So the shot clock was the other thing that very much influenced, you know, how offense has evolved over the years. When I came out of the U.S. in 1988, there was no shot clock in the U.S. in, in amateur basketball. Then I went to New Zealand. It was a 30-second shot clock. And then, of course, it, it you know, changed to 24 seconds. So, you know, those, those rules changes, they affect – uh, how coaches evolve. And, you know, I, I was a student of the game, so I was always looking to see where I could learn something and, and who could influence the way that I, uh, I teach the game. Now, I think I've, I've turned a corner, uh, probably in my late 50s, and decided that I want to be an influencer now. So, you know, I've designed a whole defensive system, that man-to-man -man defensive system that we use now to great effect. Um, and, uh, I, I'm doing a lot of stuff now with, uh, kind of Pete Carrill's high post offense, but, but a lot more, uh, deception in it rather than not so many rules. I think it's about reading the game now. And, um, so teaching players how to read the game, both on offense and defense. And this is the innovation is reading, de reading the game defensively. And uh, we're doing some very interesting things defensively now with my teams. I think uh, this is uh, the greatest uh, quality to uh, a big coach to be able to innovate, to be able to to bring something uh, new uh, in basketball. I mean, if you hold your life, you just copy systems and whatever other coaches are using. Yes, you can be a good coach, but you will never be a great coach, for sure. Well, you, you know, after I, I 40... your way of thinking. This is after what 40, I mean. After 40 years, Marcel, I have to learn to start, to start thinking on my own a little bit. For sure. <laughs> Stand on my own two feet. But it's fun, you know. I mean, I tried to do it earlier in my career, and it was a disaster. You know, I, I said, no, I better go back to listening to the <laughs> real coaches and, and uh, doing what they do. But uh, now I'm, I'm, uh, I'm branching out. I'm thinking on my own. And uh, uh, I've become extremely logical in terms of uh, basketball systems. And, I, and I've really moved to believing in the player. But you can't believe in the player if you don't teach the player. And um, sure. so this is, this is where you know, our, over, our umbrella philosophy of teaching the player allows us to be more innovative as coaches. 
let's go to the the autumn when you first meet uh Umo Bitelko in uh, European Cups. Do you remember that game? Those games, two games. I do. I do. I do. And uh there's a lot of stories behind <laughs> behind that too that we probably shouldn't uh tell all of those stories. But um I was coaching in Pauk and uh one one interesting story. You tell it. It's better if you tell it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I was just you know at that time I was coaching the second team league you know and I just watched from outside everything what was going on and I had a discussion you know with uh, the head coach at that time uh, Miodrag uh, Perisic the yes, the okay. coach at that time uh, of the team and he he told me man they are running some defense in on ball screen. It's something weird, and I don't understand the, the moment when they do what they do, and I have problems with this. So <laughs> he was struggled his mind, you know. I said, okay, you will find the solution for both, you know. But at from the first moment, me meeting you, you create problems in our minds. <laughs> well, you know, um, well, first let me say that 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 year and a half in Cluj, I, I wish it had been longer. And you know that. You know that. Okay. I was desperate to come back. I was I, I love the club. I love the city. Um I thought we had big potential there. I felt that that uh, the job of being beating Ployesht was not done. And um, you know, the way that we lost uh in, in the seventh game um of our first year was uh, heartbreaking. Um, and, uh, wait, and I, wait a minute. Uh, wait a minute. Ed. Who brought you in Cluj? Uh, Mircea Christescu. So Mircea Christescu. Yes. Let's so what see, happened? Let's, let's see if he answering the phone. <laughs> Look at this guy. <laughs> so I said. I said in the beginning that we will have. Uh, uh, a surprise in, in the show, so here he is. He's afraid I'm going to tell the truth. <laughs> hi, Ter. Hi, Ter. Hi, Marcel. Mircea, hello. How are you? I'm fine. What to say? On that, uh, on these times, I'm, I'm good. Well, I'm glad I, that you're here because we can really, you know, we can set the record straight now. It was no Mircea. problem. It was Mircea when Umobitelko came to uh, Thessaloniki to play Pauk, where I was coaching. It was Mircea that approached me after the game, and and um, he kind of whispered in my ear that I hear that uh, things aren't going so well for you here, and they weren't. They weren't paying money. They were. It was terrible situation. And um, we managed to win that game. And um, I said, I, I think Mircea, correct me if I'm wrong. I said, well, yes, that's true. But, you know, I, I, I'm obligated and I have a contract. Um, and you very kindly and very diplomatically said, well, let's stay in touch and let's see what happens. And Mircea, yes. maybe you want, you want to tell the next part of the story. <laughs> Uh, it, it was like that because uh, <clears throat> I saw in the game of the ga in the games that we are not what we can be. Uh, our coach on that time uh, he was very good uh, till one point, and we want more. We want uh, more uh, internal and international. But first of all, we want to play at maximum with the team what we have. And uh, I feel that it wasn't uh, good on that time. And after we come back, uh, like I told you, to keep in touch, when I have first chance to, to real think that uh, we must make the change, uh, I call you. You was the only coach with I called. And, and that was a very welcome call because in the, I think it was two weeks from when we played in Thessaloniki to when we came back up to Cluj to play you on the return game 
only two weeks went by, things in Pauk had gone from bad to horrible. <laughs> and um, and I have a question for you, Mircha. When we came yeah. to play that game, I felt like you had set the stage somehow to make me feel very welcome in Cluj. What what was the what was the background to that? Because we won the game, but I felt like the crowd was applauding my team. Uh, okay. Uh, the crowd from Cluj, first of all, I think that it's one of the best basketball uh, uh, fans in Romania. They know basketball very well and they feel also very good and they saw the level of the basketball. And this is first what they maybe uh, feel like that. But uh, concerning uh, you, uh, I feel that we can, uh, uh, let's say, uh, right, race together. And uh, I want to be to, to have a very good uh, opinion about Cluj. If it's necessary to to make a change to have an advantage, let's say like that. Well, definitely, um, I was so impressed with the crowd. Uh, I was so impressed with uh, the way that you had the organization set up, and um, you know, it was clear that it was a very professionally run club and uh, I didn't know you know the strength of ooh at the time you know the whole club but just from a basketball standpoint um, and being being in a situation where it, you know you just felt bad every day because players weren't paid and and coaches weren't paid and you know nobody was enthusiastic it, it just felt so good and so refreshing and then we after the game we went to you know, Sinaya, where our good friends uh, are, and uh, what a night we had there. And, you know, I I don't think I'll ever forget that night. And so by the time well, I got stories, on the boat. Taboo stories that we cannot <laughs> tell them on the boat. No, we, we'll, we'll keep that uh, between the three of us. Uh, but by the time I got on the plane to, to return to Thessaloniki, my mind was made up. And uh, I, knew, I knew then that uh, I was coming to... Romania, a place that I had never dreamed of going to coach in my life, but uh, I knew that it was going to happen. Yeah. Uh, I want to, to intervene a little bit and to tell that uh, it was a long process. You know, you saw, you said that uh, you find a, a club who was well organized and professional and everything, but uh, it took a long time and a lot of struggle especially from Mircha, to bring all those conditions into one place, to have uh, the possibility to bring a coach like you at that time. And it was a, a great move because you changed a lot. I always said in the beginning of the interview, you changed a lot of minds, basketball minds of the players, of the coach, uh, so coaches. So it was a, a very, very good move for for uh, Mircha especially, and very good move for us. For all the club. Yeah. Well, it was, was, it, was, club <laughs> it, it was great. And, um, you know, <laughs> I think the, one of the funniest things, one of the funny stories out of this is there really was quite a bit of fanfare, Mircha. You were very good at hyping you know the situation up and and we came in and what was our first game it was on the road at Aradia and they were last yeah, the no, no, no. and we lost <laughs> yeah and uh i remember thinking boy i'll bet everybody's wondering now if they made the right decision but it's funny how those things happen well i remember yeah. the first, your first speech in Aradia you were sitting and you were explaining every, every so nice, you know. Everybody was so impressed about the speech <laughs> entering the game and everything. And we went in the game and nothing. Oh, <laughs> we, we were terrible. <laughs> we were terrible in that game. And it was one of those games where it never even felt like we had a chance to play well. We, it just, everything was terrible. But, um, in some ways, it took the pressure off too. It, it, you know, it's, 
it was like, okay, now we can get to work because everybody understands we have to build something new now. And, um, but you know, it was Mircea, it was you, you and, and uh, Coach Perisic who put that team together and they were a great group of guys to work with. You know, they, they were a lot of fun and, you know, I still keep in touch with some of those guys today. So, uh, um, yeah, I have very, very fond memories of those times. Yeah, and I remember that um, because of you, not because just of you, because of the way you think and uh, how the club must uh, be, um, you said, okay, we, we need that more, we need that more, uh, like conditions, uh, like player after that when you bring bread when you feel the team and when you saw after a couple of practice and uh, after a radar game and also preparation camp uh, what we have in Turgumuresh I think uh, yeah. yep. every time uh, <clears throat> let's say that I don't have so many times uh, I was not I, I don't have so many times free I need every time to do something more and more and more. But uh, that was also great for, like Marcel said, for uh, any of us from the club to to go, to try to go at other level. You know, when I was talking about it earlier, Mircea, talking about a lot of management people around the world. And of course, you are an excellent player. So you, you know, you have a different perspective than many management ownership people in the world but you know so many have the perspective of uh, we have to win now and we don't have time to build anything uh, but also the mechanism that most organizations want to use and, and i feel this is a great wrong and a great injustice to the coaching profession the mechanism that so many in, in ownership want to use is what talented player is going to solve my problem? Where can I go to get a hero? Where can I go to get a highlight? And of course, what that so often does, and you see teams in Europe particularly changing players all the time. Well, how can you develop chemistry when you're constantly changing players? How can you develop cohesion? And I think it... I think it's an insult, actually, to the game of basketball because the game of basketball is this beautiful game that depends, and you know, both of you played, it depends on the chemistry of the players playing the game. And how can you develop a playing chemistry, much less a, a social chemistry, when you're always changing the personnel? Now, sometimes it you know, injuries and attitudes and, you know, you have to make changes. But I really believe that management people need to do a better job of identifying quality coaches and then invest in them, invest in them, keep them, stick with them, fight with them and build with them. And I think if they do that, more organizations would be successful. And as I said earlier, they'd get a better brand of basketball. That's what I would love to see. Yeah, that um, I think that it's a challenge for all, uh, let's say, all clubs. Uh, first of all, I'm agreed with you concerning the teams. You cannot build in one day. Uh, and you saw in your career a lot of clubs and uh, you build a lot of teams. Uh, Concerning uh, coaches, yes, this is the toughest part, especially when you have a big club with, uh, let's say, complete with all uh, junior teams and uh, baby, mini basket, baby basket. It's very, very tough uh, to, to try to improve uh, the, the same coaches and to try to do the best, let's say, like condition for the club. Of course, that uh, coach can be very good just if he wants that. And he try first to do a lot of things. About the organization, uh, yes, I think that we are close to uh, your idea because we don't change uh, a lot of coach just on senior, let's say, 
a one on two, three years maximum. But on junior, we have the same coaches. We we raise them from from the beginning from players, and we we try to improve them, uh, and also they. Well, this is important, and you know, to get continuity of of knowledge without without being comfortable. And I don't believe coaches should be comfortable. That's for sure. I think you have to know that every day, you know. You don't need the management ready to cut your head off, but you better be aware that your opponent wants to cut your head off. And if they do it enough times, then management doesn't have any choice. So coaches should never be comfortable. I don't believe that. But I, I do believe that if we could, if I was the owner of a team, for instance, I would back my ability to find the right coach. And then I would defend him against the fans, against the sponsors until he proved that I was wrong, but I, I wouldn't, you know, hire a coach and then say, all right, there's a gun to your head, a couple of losses and you're out of here. Coaches learn from losing. If they're good coaches, they learn. And I think failure is an important part as, as most businessmen understand failure is an important part of the growth process of learning. And um, I think that in Europe in particular, it can be done much better than it's done now. Let's go a little bit to the... You talk about the losing process. We lost the final with Boesh. Let's talk a little bit about this uh, final because I think a lot of uh, viewers, uh, they want to listen the stories behind the stage uh, about that final. That final was lost in seven games. And uh, each game has its own story. I know that we worked like I, I have no words to describe how much we worked for that final to be there, first of all, and then to win that final. And we just couldn't. What are your memories about that? Vivid. My memories are vivid. And, and I don't remember a lot about my past career. But... That was such a painful uh, story. And, you know, it's, it's not going to be a surprise to anybody that thinks back to those days. But, you know, I feel we were absolutely robbed of that finals. Not, not that we would have beaten Ployesht if everything had been fair. I don't know. I just know that it wasn't fair. I just know that in game five and game seven on the road, the free throw count from those two games combined was 92 to 29. One game, it was 47 to 19. And the other game, it was 45 to 10. So nobody can tell me that the game of basketball over seven games where the other games the foul count isn't anything like that. Nobody can tell me that that type of inconsistency reflects good refereeing. It didn't. It wasn't good refereeing. And everybody out there that's listening can doubt me or not. But we, as you said, we tried every trick in the book in that series to... And Mircha was involved as well because we talked to the Federation about the referees, get rid of that referee. We don't want that referee. That referee isn't fair. And then we talked to the team about how to use your fouls and when to use your fouls and how we make an impression on the referees with how we foul. I mean, there wasn't a stone that we left unturned. And um, especially, especially with Brad. Especially with Brad. And I was just going to say, we got in we fought our way all the way, all the way to that seventh game. We we thought, you know, one one game, one chance, just be fair in this game. And I think Brad had three fouls in the first quarter, didn't he? I in think the he second did. Yeah. yeah. And you know, we we fell behind, and uh, um, the the mountain was and then at that point there. too too hard too hard to climb that mountain. And that's the only locker room in my life after a loss that I've gone in and destroyed something. The only one. And I, and I remember I was that furious after that game. And I think I wanted to get into the referee's locker room, if I remember correctly. 
you was young, Deb. <laughs> I don't think I'd be any different today. <laughs> I don't think I'd be any different. <clears throat> but that was a bitter pill to swallow because I thought our team deserved something better than what we got. Yes, but uh, maybe we don't, uh, not maybe for sure, we don't uh, want the title in that uh, season, even that maybe we played a better basketball. But for sure, we take uh, the glory and the respect of everybody. We did. Um, and that's important. I would never say that's important. But the reason that we have organized sports and the reason we, kept, we keep score is to give a proper accounting of that respect. And, you know, nobody runs around in the world giving trophies for respect. And you're right. We earned it. But the reason that we keep score is to be able to acknowledge who is the better team on the day and who is the better season. And, uh, again, you know, we just will never know uh, what, what would have been, you know, had everything been even had everything been fair. We just don't know. And I think that was unfortunate. My, my biggest, uh, uh, how should I put it? Uh, sorry for the next season, that it was that we couldn't build uh, round bread again. Yeah, you know, the next season was a, was a tough season. It was a tough season for everybody. And, uh, you know, the... Uh, the financial crisis hit. Uh, I think Bank of Transylvania had to withdraw or, or withdraw in, you know, a, to a significant degree. Um, and, you know, everybody was under difficult pressure in that next season. And, and you know, in, in all honesty, I think all of us probably would do things differently if we had the chance to do it again. I would coach differently. I would listen to Mircha more. I would listen to you more. Um, as you said, I was young and I was butt-headed and, and very stubborn and I wanted to fight everybody. And uh, I mean, that was just my nature. I was a competitive person. Um, and, you know, although we, we, we played well at times, we had good times. In retrospect, there was too much disappointment for all of us. And uh, we suffered from that. You know what okay. Brett tell me when I fight to bring him to try to bring him back to don't go in Turkey he tell me Mitcha you don't need a very good lawyer you need a very good judge <laughs> That's right And this is what that was maybe not the money uh, for him uh, the the way of uh, how he can or he can't play in Romania, basketball uh, was, I think, uh, the main important uh, idea why he he moved in uh, Turkey. Yeah, I mean, you know that that finals the year before that took a toll, you know, on him uh, definitely. And uh, I remember talking to him because I I then coached him later in Turkey. Uh, a couple of years later, I, I had him again. So we had a lot of conversations and, you know, he just said, you know, if I can't go out and play proper basketball, uh, then they don't have enough money to pay me. Yeah. It's not about the money. It's about being able to play the game, you know, correctly. And so, you know, we all had to live with that decision because he was a great guy and, uh, and a really fine basketball player. Okay, Mircha, thank you for coming in. Uh, thank you for being well, our guest. Yeah. And uh, I'm happy that I see you, you Tab. Nice and to see you again, Mircha. We we just spoke about a week ago, so uh, good yeah. to see you again, Mircha. We keep in touch. Thank okay. you. Thank you so much. Uh, Tab, we are uh, slowly. I would stay with you all night long, but uh, <laughs> slowly we have to. Uh, get to an end to this interview. Uh, I would like, if you want, uh, to answer to some questions because uh, some of uh, our viewers wants to hear your opinion. So, if you would agree, we have a couple of uh, questions for you. Sure, absolutely. Okay. Um, 
one of the questions is, what do you think is the main difference between the basketball played in the USA and in Europe from your perspective? This we was answering before, but... No, it's a good question. It's yeah. a good question, and, and it's, a, it's a question that um, probably a lot of people have an opinion about, but a lot of people don't have the background of the American game and the European game. Um, and, and, you know, I'm blessed that I do, uh, for me, I think that you can sum it up by saying that the coaches in America, generally speaking, believe in the talent of the player. The coaches in Europe generally believe in the talent of the system. So you see a lot more individual play in the American game and, some people say, oh, that's not good coaching, but it is good coaching. It, it, it is going to the strengths of the players. The basketball is kept very simple uh, in large part, um, whereas in Europe, because the players aren't as gifted athletically, they depend more on using the fundamentals of the game <clears throat> to strengthen their play. So in America, an isolation guard doesn't want a screen in order to free himself, especially with the rules the way they are now where nobody can put their hands on. <clears throat> and also they cannot get uh, 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 help from a strong side. I mean, the rules are so made it, so everything is in advantage of the offense uh, player. So he can have space. So now it's up to you what you can do with that ball, how you create that separation. That's correct. And in Europe, of course, without that, you have to depend on <clears throat> the conceptual elements of the game, screening, cutting, uh, spacing. And that's why the European players are generally thought to be more intellectual than the American players is just because they're taught that game. The American players could be taught exactly the same thing, but it's just not as necessary in the American I, game. I, I remember one of our many conversations about basketball. And you said in one moment, hey, it would be great if we can uh, go in the States and teach the American kids in this way of playing. You know, so American kids, very athletic with the mentality of fundamentals from Europe. You know, something, Marcel, that many coaches say that you get a player, right? <clears throat> and I don't have an example that comes to mind right away, but you, you get a player who is an amazing athlete right? But he just doesn't have the IQ of the game. And he frustrates you to death because, you know, you see all the, the, the possibilities without the outcomes. And then you have a player who, uh, and, and, you know, Mihai Silvasan is a great example, who wasn't a great athlete, but had a great head for the game. And you say, if we could only put those two together and take his head and put it on his body, <laughs> and it's the same thing. You know, if we could transplant the European game to the American landscape, and I think the NBA, as I said, is doing some of that now, then we would see the game played in a way that, that would be so beautiful and, and so elegant. And, uh, uh, but, you know, it's, it's, we uh, have to wait. Wishful see. thinking. Yeah, wishful thinking. <laughs> Okay, next question. Uh, Hege Trainer. Hello, coach. Uh, what is your advice for a young coach who wants to be a really good skills coach and also a team coach for young kids? Um, in today's world, you know, everything has changed because of the internet and the, and the access to information. And I think, I think the first thing you need to do is Go to the great coaches, uh, the Obradoviches, the Pesiches, uh, the Ivkovic, um, particularly the Serbian coaches, uh, you know, but also uh, a Shashevsky and, and um, 
you know, some of the great coaches uh, out of America and read what they say is important for a basketball player to have in terms of skills. So, so you understand what the goal is. Then you go on YouTube and you look for coaches that are coaching drills and fundamentals to achieve those goals. And then that's what you do. You take players and you drill them and drill them and drill them in the fundamentals, but don't waste your time drilling them. I see some skills coaches doing this now. They spend time drilling players to do things they're never going to do in a game, but it looks good. It looks really good, but it, they're never going to do it. They're never going to do it in a game. So they sell. They sell themselves. Correct. So ask, you know, in any way that you can, ask the experts, what are the real skills that players need to know? And then you can find encyclopedias of videos on YouTube showing you how to build those skills. And then just copy and paste. You know, just do what the Japanese do. Just take the skill, take the drill, and do it better. And the one thing I would say in today's world, we're softening ourselves so much. Uh, we don't tend to have the disciplines that we used to do. And with young players, they absolutely need that. I believe that you have to treat every human being with respect. But the most important thing to respect as a coach is the potential of the player. And if you respect the player's potential, then you're going to do everything you can to force that player to work to achieve that potential. You don't respect the player for what he is today. If you did that, you would leave him alone. You wouldn't teach him. You respect the player for what he can become. And so when you take that responsibility on as a coach, and the same if you're coaching young teams, when you take that responsibility on, your job is not to work with what you have. Your job is to work with what can possibly be. And so that's where you have to keep your sights set. And that means you've got to drive your players. And that's hard. That's hard work. It's not easy. It isn't, it isn't selling candy to a kid. You know, this is selling, you know, bitter chocolate to a kid. But you know that that bitter chocolate is much healthier for that kid than that sweet candy. So you give it to them anyway, and, and you force them to accept those disciplines. And, you know, the modern way of being nice to everybody, well, it's just not me. So I can't really advise you to, to do that. But I do believe that you always have to show respect for your players. This is great advice. Great advice. Uh, nobody... I mean, you like coach, your first job is to to help the, the talent to grow. And as you say, to have respect, to cherish what he has and to, to make him grow. Uh, about what you said about uh, great coaches, now we have one of uh, those great coaches in Romania. We have Dule Bujosevic in Cluj. Yes. And, and uh, my advice is also for this uh, young coach, Go and try to contact, go to practices. Nobody will uh, stop you to watch, ask, and you will find answers if, if you really want. That's absolutely correct. And, and let me say this, too, to, to all the coaches that might be listening tonight. You've got to adopt the mentality as a coach that you're a servant. You serve the players. Now, there's a lot of ways of doing that. But if you think that those players are there for you, then my advice to you would be to get out of the game. My advice to your boss would be to get you out of the game. <laughs> Because we had our day as players. The game is for the players. So when you decide to take on the responsibility of being a coach, 
you decide to take on the responsibility of serving. And you have to keep that in your mind all the time. You can be tough. You can be demanding. You can be angry. Um, you can be kind and fatherly and brotherly. You can be all of those things. But your primary role is to serve the dreams of your players. And if you do that, what you're going to find is something quite amazing. Those players will give you everything when they know that you are there for them and not for your record or yourself or your victories. So that, that's probably the best advice that I can give to any coach. Okay, Tab, but you know, this is a, a process, a process of uh, maturity. Um, I uh, also had this phase in which I believe that I am the most important guy on the planet. Because I did too. I no, did too. You're right. Uh, yeah. And you need time. You need failure. You need uh, to experience uh, different uh, uh, life stages to get you there. Of course, it's very good to have somebody near you to correct, to advise you, to uh, adjust things that you might not uh, doing well, you know. But if you are on alone, then uh, it's not so easy. And I'm very happy that you brought this here because I think it's a very important moment of this interview uh, for the young coaches who are listening. Well, Marcel, you're exactly right that we all evolve. You know, there's an evolution to life. You know, there, there, we go through changes and, and, and certainly you and I both did and we grew up and we matured. But even when we were going through those changes, we had an underpinning philosophy about why we were doing what we did. And for me, when I was a young coach, it was an outlet for my competitiveness. <clears throat> I just wanted to compete. <clears throat> Excuse me. And because I wasn't that level of a player, coaching was my outlet to do that. Now, that was wrong. Even though I had to go through those evolutionary steps, I still could have had the correct philosophy. I still could have understood that when I accepted the role of a coach, I no longer was the primary competitor. I no longer had the right to put my competitive instincts in front of my players' dreams. And I wish I had known that when I was young. <clears throat> Because I probably, you know, I probably should apologize to a lot of my players from when I was a young coach. Because I don't think that I served them well. And if I had the chance, I certainly would apologize to them. Yes, you're right. I have this feeling too. <laughs> yeah. Believe me. But... This is life. And, uh, of course, uh, uh, first of all, all these players must know that uh, it was nothing intentional. It was just a part of the process of what we are not in, in these days. So, uh, uh, for sure, um, we could have done a better job at that time. But uh, I think nobody is born di directly with this knowledge. And you have to go through steps to get there as fast exactly as you can right. is exactly the right. and, and that's why it's great that your listeners have the chance to ask these questions because that's exactly how you learn uh another question what is your opinion about small players like uh, six feet i mean you know there are a lot of players the, the, their dreams are same big like those i don't know two meter ten players with uh, considered by everybody like uh, big prospects but the dream is the same the, the dream is absolutely the same and now there are more examples than ever of the smaller player succeeding at the higher level you know you have a lot of nba players now that are around that six foot range <clears throat> but again the rules in america have brought the small player back into the game because with quickness and skill it's very tough to defend these kids 
And so, you know, the, the rules makers are helping the smaller player uh, by creating these defensive handicaps, uh, which promote quickness and skill. So, you know, the, the, the challenge for a smaller player is to look at the game of basketball and then say, where do I have a disadvantage? And, and every player, you know, has to make that assessment for themselves. So you might get a super quick five foot 11 player. So there's no quickness disadvantage, but they might be really skinny. So they might say, well, I have a big disadvantage in defending bigger players around the rim or in the post. So then you have to learn, you have to make it your absolute objective to learn how to be a problem defending the post. Use your quickness, use your feet. Don't try to muscle, don't try to bang. You might get another small player who's like a, you know, a fire hydrant, you know, they're six foot, but 100 and, you know, or 80 kilos or 85 kilos, and they can push their way, you know, in the post, but maybe they're not as quick. So how do you carve out your role in the game? You do that by identifying your weaknesses. And height isn't necessarily a weakness because it can be a strength. But you better be skilled. You better be quick. You better be extremely tough. And you better have a determination you better have the small man syndrome, you know, the Napoleonic syndrome that I'm going to prove to you that I'm tougher than you, that I'm better than you. And, you and then you can, believe. yeah. And then you can, you know, make ground. It's, it's the same mentality of an underdog basketball team. You know, my New Zealand team playing in the world championships. It's the same thing. Figure out where you're weak and then compensate because you are weak. You ha you have a disadvantage, so you have to turn other things into big advantages, and uh, then you can you can make your way. We have a girl here that wants to ask, what do you think it's easily more easily to train a team of boys or, or girls? <laughs> I've only um, I've only entered that uh, arena uh, once in my entire career. Uh, when I was coaching back in uh, Auckland in the New Zealand League, we, we didn't have a gym to play in, uh, funnily enough. And um, so we were trying to find a gym. So I was out searching around and, you know, to find a place actually to train, not play our games, but to train. And there was a good gymnasium at one of the girls' high schools. So I went over there and I met the athletic director and I said, you know, how, uh, how can we use your gym to practice? And she said, well, if you'll coach my high school team, then you can practice in the gym. So th that was the compromise. And um, I found that girls were uh, very, very easy to get them to play as a team. They, they were very easy to... Um, to bend their will to what the coach wanted. But girls are impossible when they lose their emotional balance. I had no ability to bring them back <laughs> none whatsoever. <laughs> I had to say, I'm sorry, go sit down and cry or whatever. <laughs> I can't help you in this moment. Um, well, I looked at this is in the real life. The same. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. We, we, we can do nothing when something yeah. like this happens in every stage yeah. of our life. I, I think with, with any male basketball player, I can deal with anything. Even if they want to fight me, I can deal with that. <laughs> if they want to quit, I can deal with that. But if a girl says that, um, you know, I remind her of her father yelling at her and it makes me so sad. I, I, I have no answer for that. I, I just have to say, please go sit down. And, you know. Look, uh, same Sorana. Uh, this is uh, the girl what I'm talking about. Uh, is asking what uh, can do a player to reach their full potential? Um, two things. 
two things. Uh, study the game. You, you must want to understand the game like a coach. Even though you're a player, you must want to understand the game like a coach. And it isn't that hard. Marcel, you know, you and I are not that smart, right? So the game of basketball, well, maybe you are, but I'm not that smart. <laughs> the game of basketball is not that difficult to learn. And the drills are not that difficult to learn. How you communicate that to other people, there can be an art in that, but actually acquiring the knowledge is very easy. That's number one. You cannot reach your potential without that. Number two, very simple. You must have a work ethic that exceeds your human nature. So what do I mean by that? Well, if, if we come to a mountain and we see two roads, one of them goes around the mountain in a nice, gentle uh, elevation, and the other goes straight up, which one are we going to take? Well, human nature is going to say, it's going to take longer, but take the easy road. So we don't get tired, our legs don't hurt. Our human nature tells us to be comfortable. If you want to reach your potential, your work ethic must take you beyond that. You must seek pain. You must seek the most difficult pathway. And you must love doing that. So with the knowledge you have in your head and the desire to seek pain in order to improve, there's no reason that you don't take one step after another after another towards your potential. And that's all you can ask of yourself. Great answer. Uh, and finally, the last question, one former player and very good friend of uh, me, a great player, Branko Jorovic, asks you, uh, he's coach now, by the way, uh, do you think that is a real problem now, in this time, to bring and keep young players on the court, to make them work? Because kids have internet and they have watching, uh, they are watching everything there. So, you know, they are willing more to stay on the virtual world and work there than in the real world court. Marcel, the first coach that I ever worked for, I was an assistant coach for, was a, a brilliant guy, a wonderful human being. His name was Larry Chapman. He's still alive. And, uh, and he just retired from coaching at the age of 78. Wow. Um, a great, great human being as well. And he was from the South in America. So he had that Southern accent and he had that, that Southern wisdom, you know, which would come out so often in these little sayings that, you know, they were just treasures. They're just treasures. And I would tell Bronco this. You can't push a rope. And when you think about that, if you try to push a rope, it doesn't go anywhere. It just folds up. And if you're trying to convince young people today to be a basketball player because they have marvelous potential, because they look the part, because they can shoot threes and they can dunk it, and they want to sit in front of a computer and play you know, 2K, NBA 2K, or you're trying to push a rope and you're the one that's going to end up frustrated. And I'll tell you something, and I'll well, finish with this. Uh, you know, Romania is a, is a great Christian nation. You know, I was raised in a Catholic family by a very, very devout father and mother. And my father was a basketball coach, a, a very, very exceptionally good basketball coach. And I remember telling him one time a story about a player that I was coaching that I, I, I was doing everything I could to help this kid with his off-court problems, his on-court problems. He had amazing potential, a big six-foot-nine athletic kid, nice kid, but always in trouble, always bad grades, you know. And I was telling my dad, 
all of these things that I was doing to help this kid settle down and find his way and he could be a great player. And my dad, in, in his very candid way, my dad was a man of few words. He looked at me and, and my father never swore and he never took the Lord's name in vain. He looked at me at the dinner table and he said, son, who the hell do you think you are? And I remember, I said, what, what do you mean? Who do I think I am? And, and, you know, to put it that way, who the hell do you think you are? I said, what do you, what do you mean? I, you know, I, I want to help this kid. I want to, you know, get this kid to be what he can be. And he said, son, if you want to be a basketball coach, stop trying to be Jesus Christ. <laughs> you, can't, you can't save them. And don't try to save them. Coach them. And so from that point forward, I understood that I could be a very good basketball coach to a kid that wants to be a very good basketball player. But if they don't want that, deep down in their heart, then I'm wasting their time, they're wasting my time, and all I'm doing is going to lose whatever little bit of hair I got left. And, you know, I, I thank my father and I thank Coach Larry Chapman for those pearls of wisdom that helped me understand how to be a good coach and how I shouldn't try to be a good coach sometimes. Ted, another great answer. Uh, man, we are talking one hour and 45 minutes now. So somehow we have to get to a closure. So please um, address some words to people from Cluj, people, uh, fans from Cluj who really appreciate your time spent in, uh, in Cluj and for sure they would uh, wanted to see you much more time in Cluj. Marcel, let me say this. <clears throat> 40 years I've coached 10 countries, 10 different countries I've had coaching jobs in. Uh, too many clubs, teams, <laughs> to to count and, and you know it, it probably wouldn't sound genuine if i started by saying Cluj was the best place ever you know it, everybody would go oh, you're just saying that because you're speaking to romanians you're speaking to people from Cluj. i don't know if it was the best place ever i do know this i didn't want to leave when i left it hurt me and it and it wasn't just because the club was so good. It wasn't the Romanian winters, I can promise you that. <laughs> it wasn't that I thought uh, the future was going to be so bright and we would have this great team. It wasn't just that I needed to, to have another shot at Ploiești. It wasn't any of those things. It was all of those things, but all of those things were wrapped up in this psyche of the people of Umobitelco and Ucluj. They all wanted all of those things as well. I think I've had great teams that I've loved more than any team I had in Cluj, but I think that I felt a comradeship with the fans of Cluj that I probably haven't felt until I reached the job I'm in now, the, the Ateneo University. And again, it's another university. That was a university club. This is actually a university team. But one of the greatest memories I, I have ever had is, and I don't remember which game, I, I tend to think it was after game six when we played our last game of that season and we won, and I think we all went over to the crowd, if I remember correctly. It and was I, a great feeling, yeah. And I think they held a big sign up that said something about, please come back and be with us next year. And, and I thought to myself, look at, look at what I'm standing down here on the court is in front of me. 
How many people on the face of the planet get to experience that for even one second? I was so honored. I was so moved. I was so sold that, you know, this was my home. These were my people. This was my future. And I, I felt that so strong in that moment. And that is what the people of Cluj gave me. And I still have it today. I, I've never lost that. So my message to them is thank you. You know, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Because that memory is as powerful personally as any memory I have in my coaching career. And I was so blessed to spend the time with you, with the other coaches, with the great players, the great friends that we had there, and with the people of Cluj. And I, I'm so thankful for this time with you now and the opportunity to say what I've just said to those people because I didn't have the opportunity when I left, you know, it was bad feelings and it was, you know, it was a tough time for everybody. And, you know, there was hurt feelings all around, but in the core of my being, there was so much love for that club, for those people, for, for even, even the people I was mad at at the time, there was so much love there. So thank you. You know, uh, uh, they say that time heals everything, and uh, you see, you have the the opportunity to to uh, say all what you have on your soul to Cluj people and to the people that you work with. I'm so happy that we had the chance to talk first of all, we too, and then of course to share our discussion with our uh, viewers and our fans and what to say it was you know supposed to be one hour of talking but i just couldn't end <laughs> this discussion it was so interesting so fine uh, i would i would like again to thank you and to congratulate you for uh, what you did but not so much i want to i i wait to see what is coming next uh, all your achievements from now on there is more. There is more. Marcel, you are a blessing to me. Uh, you're a blessing to my family. Um, I thank you very much. And uh, I thank you for this opportunity. Um, and look, we have talked for a long time. And you know what? It's so nice. I don't even care if anybody's listening anymore because I'm still getting the chance to talk to you. I, mean, I hope they are. But um, I've enjoyed the time with you. I look forward to the next time we can give each other a hug, give each other a, a message. Uh, I thank God for your health, for your improved health. Thank I thank God for my health. And uh, sure. I hope uh, the good Lord continues to bless the community of Cluj and, and the country of Romania. And uh, I, I say to all of the people there, thank you. And I love you very much. Thank you, Tal.